I've been a, um, a journalist for um, about 25 years. I've been a foreign correspondent for more than 15 years. In that time, I spent um, quite a bit of time in China and uh, covering China. And um, the, my last incarnation as a correspondent in Beijing, I was a uh, the Beijing, I was a China correspondent for the Australian newspaper. And I was there from 1998 until 2002. And when 9-11 happened, China wasn't really on the news radar. Um, nobody cared about what was happening in China. The, the news attention of the world moved west. And so I moved west as well. And so I, I went through Central Asia and into Afghanistan and covered the northern assault and the siege of Mar Mazari Sharif. And I went back to China and completed my contract for the Australian. And in late 2002, I moved to Istanbul, where I became correspondent for the Irish Times. And my reason for moving to Istanbul was solely to cover the war in Iraq, because it was quite obvious that there was going to be a war in Iraq. Well, the war started on um, the 20th of, uh, of March 2003, and by then I was already in northern Iraq. And there was supposed to be a northern front. The Americans and the British had expected that the Turkish government would allow their air forces to use their bases to acquit a northern front. And the idea originally was to trap Saddam Hussein's forces in a pincher between north and south. Uh, the northern front didn't happen. So along with a couple of hundred other foreign correspondents based in, um, mostly in Arbil, which is the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, an autonomous region where we could move freely, um, we found ourselves cooling our heels for a couple of weeks, sort of looking for things to do. And there was a very subtle US campaign uh, that rolled out and then became very important. And around about, well, Baghdad fell on the 9th of April, and after Baghdad fell, it was really just a domino sequence of the major cities. On April 11th, it was pretty obvious on by the 9th and the 10th, in what order the cities would fall. So on the, the early in the morning of April 11th, 2003, I got in my car with my driver and a couple of other correspondents I was working with on a daily basis and drove to Mosul and got there very early in the morning, but in time to see the place just explode, the way every other Iraqi city had. Um, and the image of looting that we'd already seen on the television from Baghdad was happening in front of my eyes. And even though the Iraqi army had disappeared, the Americans hadn't arrived yet. So the place was going nuts. Anything that could be um, hauled out of a, a government building or any sort of public building at all was being hauled out. And anything that couldn't was being destroyed. Buildings were being set on fire and people were getting very, very worried. That afternoon, the Americans finally arrived and I was standing in the middle of um, the garden of what had been the Mosul governor's office. Um, it was surrounded then by American Marines with their um, with their uh, boss going through the building looking for a headquarters for the for the U.S. Uh, occupation. When we were fired on by snipers, there were tens of thousands of people standing around in silent crowds around the square, around outside the the governor's office waiting for some sort of sign that the Americans had arrived and everything was going to be okay. And in the midst of this, we, were, we started taking incoming fire. So the Americans ran out of the building, they hopped in their jeeps and they drove off and we did the same. And it became pretty obvious day one that something was brewing in Mosul. A couple of days later, I went back to Arbil in um, Iraqi Kurdistan, and over the course of the next few days, I did what I'd been doing for the duration of the war, which was going to a different area every day, looking for news, finding out what was unfolding. By then, the international news agenda had switched to Baghdad, because that was where, you know, um, basically, it being the capital, the major networks had moved down there, people wanted to know what was happening in, in, um, in Baghdad. But around about, I guess it would have been the 12th or the 13th, I went back to Mosul and I went into one of the major hospitals because I wanted to know what was going on. There had been an incident a day earlier where Americans had fired into a crowd and um, it had been reported on by a French correspondent for the AFP and the Americans had denied it. And so we really wanted to know what was going on. Went to the hospital, the major teaching hospital in Mosul, and I went up to the head uh, 
I guess you call it a conference room, the president's office, where all the heads of department were having their morning meeting. And I hovered around waiting for the meeting to break up so that I could talk to the president of the hospital to find out what was going on. And um, before I had an opportunity to do that, one of the doctors came up to me and said, would you like to meet my wife? And I said, of course. So he took me out of the conference room and sitting on, a, on an ordinary chair behind a door in a little alcove was a, a, a very petite woman, round face in a big black billowy dress and he said, this is my wife. And I said, how do you do? Uh, my name's Lynn, what's your name? And I spoke very slowly and clearly because I thought she wouldn't understand my Australian accent and she said, Pauline. And I thought, that's not an Iraqi name. And I said, where are you from? And she said, Lancashire. I said, oh, have you been here very long? She said, yeah, about 30 years. Do you mind if I borrow your phone? I'd really like to call my mum back in, back in England to let her know that we're all okay, because she's got no idea if we're dead or alive. And that's how I met Pauline. And she invited me to come back to Mosul a few days later to have um, lunch or dinner, just to come back to her home. And you know, I just went on with, with my daily newspaper reporting activities but that particular day it was a Friday I happened to find myself in Mosul and so I, um, I took myself off to her home and uh, you know I knocked on the door and the door opened and this in enormous sort of wave of warmth came down the steps towards me because they had got up that morning in with every expectation that I would turn up for lunch and that's what they wanted you know that's what they had been gearing their day towards. And so I was sort of bustled in and enveloped in this warm welcome. And she's got two kids and they spoke English with thick Lancashire accents. And, you know, they plied me with fizzy drink and tea. And every now and then the kids would get up and run into their rooms and come back with, with gifts. A little silver Quran cover or a, a heart-shaped stone that I could put on a chain around my neck or a little template, kind of a stamped pendant with a with a desert and oasis palm tree scene in it and just and a gold pen, a pen with gold ink in it, just their way of kind of saying we're so thrilled to have you in our home. And I found that in a lot of places Afghanistan was the same, that when people like me turn up, it's kind of an indication to people that things are gonna maybe possibly get back to normal. And I think that's what that's that's how they were hoping things would be. So we had um, we had a bit of a chat, and then um, we were shown to the table, and I could see through from where where I was sitting on a sofa through an alcove and into a dining room, and I could see that the table was set. And you know, I'd been living in this hotel in Arbil for you know weeks and weeks, and eating big chunks of mutton and pre-cooked spaghetti, and you know, I was just sick to death of the food. And I thought a home-cooked meal, what could be better? And I was imagining, you know dolma that Pauline had just made and bread hot and straight out of the oven that we'd used to dollop up yogurt dip and hummus that she'd just put the chickpeas in her food processor to make and I was I was so looking forward to it and I thought we'd all sit around and chat and laugh and talk about how the war was over now and things would get back to normal and we sat down and I, I looked at the food on the table and I looked at Pauline as she was sort of backing out of the room traditional Arab style please eat we're off and the food was an indication to me of what life had really been like for ordinary Iraqi people. They had been subject to international sanctions for uh, more than yeah, about 12 years since the first Gulf War ended and the international community wanted to squeeze Saddam's government and one of the ways that they did that was to stop the government selling its oil on the international market so it couldn't make proper um, foreign exchange well in proper quantities to feed its people properly and so in in compensation for that the United Nations sent in food and the food was distributed by um, a government monopoly and the people who distributed it kept the best for themselves and sold it on the international market and the rubbish went to the people and so the bread was grey because it was made with flour that had to be sieved for weevils and stones and the chicken was also grey it was like it had walked from Syria and the only the only thing to drink was you know that too sweet syrupy fizzy orange pop and it was it was a real epiphany for me and I, I kind of realized too that probably what we were being served was what they were going to have for their dinner if we hadn't turned up it was quite an amazing experience and really that meal is 
where I got the title from my book, for my book from, it, that was the high tea that I was served in Mosul and it really opened my eyes more than anything else had at that stage to what life had been like for people like Pauline's family, ordinary Iraqi people. So after lunch, we rejoined um, Pauline and her husband Ali and her children Noor and Jamal in the living room and Pauline said, I have a friend who will be really angry with me if I, if I haven't told her that you're here so she can come and meet you and I'm just going to call her. So she, she went to the telephone and 20 minutes later standing outside the glass doors of, of uh, Pauline's living room was Margaret from Newcastle. And Margaret came in and she'd also been living there for 30 years. She'd also met her Iraqi husband in the north of England while the men were studying on government scholarships, fallen in love with him and followed him back to Iraq. And there they were. So I left and I went back to uh, Arbil and then the war was over and the news agenda moved and I drove back to Istanbul where I was living. And then I moved to London in, at the end of 2003. And in early 2004, I went to Turkmenistan via Istanbul and I picked up my mail from where I had been living before I'd moved to London. And there was a, a Christmas card from Pauline and it had been posted from Syria. And it was, hello, you might remember me, I'm the lady that you met in, in Mosul. And no, still no way of contacting her, no email, no telephone, the infrastructure had been effectively destroyed. And um, that was that. And then in 2005, while I was still living in London, just out of the blue, I got an email from Pauline, because I don't change my email address, and, hi, I'm still here, this is my life, how are you? And, yeah, that was, yeah, that was September or October 2005, and as it turned out, Margaret, her friend from Newcastle, had moved to London. And so Pauline put me in touch with Margaret and you know, I went and visited Margaret and because we were all in contact and life had been so extraordinary and taken such amazing turns for both women since the war that was supposed to bring freedom and democracy to Iraqi people, I started to talk to them about whether or not they liked the idea of me writing a book that told the story of their lives because they had essentially been ordinary Iraqi wives and mothers and daughters-in-law, uh, for people to be able to understand beyond the headlines which had become dominated really by the horror of war and insurgency and murder and um, insane religious uh, bloodletting. Um, and they agreed, they, they thought it was a good idea. And so uh, in January last year, 2006, I began writing the book that has just been released called High Tea in Mosul.